that, I want to thank everybody for coming and showing your interest. Uh, my name is Bob Chase, and I'm with the Applications Department here with Parasource Global. I've been here for about 16 years, and prior to that, um, I was no, I, I was a old powerhouse engineer. So I, a lot of this stuff is I come from an honest background. Uh, um, just to give everybody a little, little bit of a, an overview of the posimetric feeder. Um, material enters at the top and, and takes a fairly constant density. Most bulk solids will form a very constant dense mass as it enters the rotating feeder. Once it's completely within the feeder, it locks up and moves as a solid. As, as the disks of the feeder move, the material moves, it, it, there should be no differential at all. When it finally finds an opening in the feeder, it just unlocks and gently discharges. Um, there's no degradation of material. Um, it pretty much what goes in comes out and it looks pretty much the same. The basic feeder is composed of a shaft and hub with discs mounted on it. It would look to the casual observer like a cable spool. Um, the discs are grooved uh, to increase the amount of locking mechanism that is necessary for the feeder to work. Um, when, we, when, we build, when people build chutes, they want them to be smooth. Here we, because the the smooth chute helps material not build up inside. Here we want it to lock to the disc. Um, we also put a couple of plows on the outside surfaces of the end disc of the feeder just to help remove fines that may get past a clearance. Um, between the discs is an abutment plate that acts as a disc scraper. It also helps to make sure that all of the material goes into the feeder rather than bypasses and just falls through the discharge. That way we control the discharge rate. We can also stack disks on the same shaft uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, we increase the capacity at a given speed. Uh, that's important because abrasion is a, is a function of speed. Speed goes up, wear goes up, so we want to keep speed to a minimum. Uh, so we can increase the capacity. Conversely, you can uh, do the same capacity at lower speeds. Sometimes we do it to match a hopper opening. More often, we match downstream equipment like a crusher. We want to spread the feed over the entire crusher inlet so we can choose a, a size and a number of disks to help match that crusher inlet. How, how do we go about selecting one? Again, I look at the inlet conditions and dimensions. Um, we don't want to neck down an inlet any more than we have to because as material has to go into a smaller opening, you run into more chances for it to plug. We look at the discharge conditions and dimensions. Again, looking at that possibly a crusher downstream and of course, we do look at capacity. Uh, we, when I have an application, I will look at these in no particular order. It's, um, it's mostly a matter of experience. One of the things we can provide for you is a, an application sheet. This is in PDF form that you, that a, you or a customer could populate the yellow fields on there with, with information and send it back and we can, that gives, any piece of information we can gather uh, about the application, about, about dimensions, um, will help provide a, a better, more confident uh, selection of the machine. We have about 370 posimetric feeders in service. Uh, the lion's share of them are in electric power generating stations, primarily for coal. Um, the largest number of units 
is in the boiler house feeding coal pulverizers. That's a function of the fact that a plant may have two or possibly three crushers, but they will have 10, 12, 15, 20 coal pulverizers, and each one of those gets its own feed. Um, these are some of the materials that one of the one of the features of the posimetric, the one of the things that sets it apart from everybody else, is its ability to handle wet, sticky material. You can see in the upper right, this was some material that was sent to us for testing. Um, it had the consistency of toothpaste, and this is the same uh, same plant um, down in the lower left. That's a 30-inch diameter downpipe from a bunker, and you can see it's completely bridged over. And until we can break that bridge, um, nothing's going to go into any kind of feeding. Um, another feature of the posimetric is that it is very, very linear, the discharge rate. At a given speed, it will discharge the same amount of solids uh, regardless of the moisture. This was a test that was run. These people wanted a coal metering device to feed their pulverizer because they had to account for the amount of coal burned on one unit to generate power and on a second unit to generate steam for a commercial sale. So we, we installed one feeder and over a series of three or four days uh, ran a series of tests and the upper line with the blue squares is the amount of coal that was discharged by weight per revolution of the feeder. The dashed red line is what the coal moisture was for each one of those tests. And the bottom line is the amount of dry solids that was discharged for, one, for each one of these tests. And you see that the, the two the upper and lower lines track together, but the lower line is a lot flatter. What, that, what that's indicating is that the amount of dry solids discharged by the posimetric is constant at a given speed and because each revolution put it, puts out the same amount. Uh, does this regardless of coal moisture. We took the same coal and tested it over a wider range of moisture levels. Again, the upper line is what the, the weight per revolution that was discharged. The lower line, much flatter, is the dry solids discharge per revolution of the feeder. So again, it just serves to demonstrate that the moisture content does not affect the output of actual fuel per revolution of the feeder. I, I mentioned earlier that one of the things we want, one of the reasons, the reason we put the grooves in the discs is to help the material lock to the disc so that material only moves as the discs move. When they don't move, the material doesn't move and vice versa. This is the oldest feeder in the United States. Um, it was two years old when this picture was taken. We, our intent was to measure the thickness of, of parts to see how much it had worn over two years of operation. When we opened it up, we could see corrosion on the discs and on the hub in the center. And that indicated to us that coal wasn't slipping inside here, because if it was, it would be shined up. Uh, we also found that the glide plate, which is the exterior portion, stationary portion of the feeder, showed no wear that we could measure and that just told us that there was very little force being exerted uh, in the form of friction. Um, the way we know this is that the, a posimetric like this will draw the same motor amperage at full capacity or, or empty. Uh, there's very little frictional loss at all. And if there were friction against that glide plate, the amperage would go up as the, as the speed went up. Uh, we talked about crushers, and this is probably a little hard to see, but we can certainly provide this to anybody who needs it. Um, this describes 
the characteristics for feeding a reversible crusher. Um, you can see on the left that the material is falling from exactly 12 o'clock above the crusher. The machine is reversible, so it has to come in at the same angle all the time. The point at the top of the sh chute up a little bit into the feeder, there is zero vertical velocity at that point. So by knowing how far it is to the crusher, we can accurately predict how fast the material will be going, and that's part of the characteristics for proper feed as well. On the right, we can see that the material is spread over the entire inlet of the crusher rotor. That helps to minimize the wear. The, the, if you starve one portion of the crusher, that portion does not wear, and that will end up dictating uh, how much you can adjust the crusher and how well you can control your product size. This, this, and this is a perfect example of this. This was a photograph taken of a plant burning a waste fuel with a lot of rock and silica in it. And this is after over a million tons of coal going through there. And you can see that the hammer wear is virtually straight all the way across the machine. Another place we've found a lot of use for posimetric feeders in powerhouses is in the area of material handling transfer locations. There's no crusher there. It's just uh, conveyors have to change directions or they need to control the amount of reclaim, that sort of thing. Uh, the benefits that uh, users talk about are good dust control because the feeder remains full all the time. It cuts down on the air that that is generated by a conveyor running underneath it, uh, so the dust is, is reduced. Um, the feeders are extremely reliable. There's only one moving part. They don't require a lot of op uh, operator attention, and most of these are in remote locations in the plant where operators, believe me, operators don't care to go. Uh, so reliability is, is a big factor. These typically tend to be very large, uh, 800 to, I think, the largest capacity feeder we have in, in service now is 1,800 tons an hour. This is a very large transfer feeder from a power plant in Arkansas. You can see how each one of the doors is centered on a duct of the feeder. This is a 1760 X6 feeder, and it you have access through both the lower door and the upper door to the discharge area of the feeder. We have one project where we were feeding wood chips. Um, this is um, this was an, a an adjunct fuel for a uh, fluidized bed application. Um, we. I, I always caution people that with wood chips, we want to take these on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't want to make blanket statements yet. Yeah, we've handled wood chips, or we've handled biomass, because the, the term biomass can mean almost anything, and we re really want to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. But for what the machine was asked to do, this, this has been a very good installation. Um, small things can make a difference, however. We found during testing that the material on the left, that's, that's the material they, that the customer submitted to us for testing. Uh, the material on the right has a lot of long, slabby, finger-like pieces, and the material on the left fed very nicely. The material on the right was more problematic, so it shows just how important the products, uh, the material sizing can be for something like biomass. Another, another industry where we've placed a lot of posimetric feeders is in the cement industry. Um, they're used on coal mills, just like they are in a powerhouse. Um, this is one particular installation. Um, coal comes off a conveyor overhead, falls down through that chute, and the feeder meters it into 
the mill. One of the, in addition to controlling the feed rate into that mill, it also helps because the feeder is full and the chute is partially filled, it helps uh, reduce the air infiltration into the mill, um, which helps promote good grinding. Um, this particular installation um, is outdoors. They had a little problem with their discharge chute for a while. They put some, some electric strip heaters underneath it that it worked pretty well. And they told me they were doing that. I said, I can't imagine that it's going to work, but they did. This, this, this coal gets rained on every day. It's in South Florida and it gets rained on every day. So wet coal not flowing down out of the feeder into the mill was, was a big problem for them. Um, more significantly, that's, that installation is pretty much like a coal power plant installation. Um, we also have installed a number of posimetric feeders on raw grinding mills where they prepare the rock and limestone and iron uh, to prepare it for the kiln. It's a little hard to see. Um, behind that beam up there, you can see the green feeder. It looks a lot like the last, last drawing. The installation looks very similar. It's just on a much bigger scale. And again, here's it's kind of hard to take pictures in these places because there's always handrails or structural steel in the way. But this is just a close-up of that same machine. The first one of these that we did, we found that we had excessive disc wear. So we created a, a liner for the disc that slips on and then is held to the disc with uh, small fasteners. If you look at this picture right about in the center, you can see that the, you not only have a liner that covers the face of the disc, but you also have a band about two inches wide that goes around the perimeter of the disc. This protects that base disc from decreasing in diameter. We put a chromium carbide overlay on the glide plate. This is the stationary piece at the, at the belly of the feeder. Um, we found that the carbide, we tried AR400 and it, was, did, it lasted longer, but we found that, that the carbide has given us very good wear life. When we designed the, the L feeder, which is the raw mill feeder, um, we had three basic pieces to our design philosophy. We wanted to make the most, how do I, I'm, I just lost my word. Um, we wanted the most um, easily accessible parts to be the ones that wore the fastest. We wanted the parts that were deeper into the machine that required more disassembly to be more robust so they would last longer. We wanted to be able to remove and strip down the feeder without having to hang the rotor from anything. And we wanted to do it without breaking the inlet or outlet connections to the rest of the plant equipment. So here's one that's been completely stripped down. It's actually going to going assembly, but you could strip that feeder down and look just like that. And they don't have to, it can, it can be rebuilt in place or it can be removed and taken into a shop and done at some other time. A couple of plants have bought spares just for that reason. This particular customer asked us that we, we want to create a feeder that will last for one year so that they can rebuild it during outages. Um, when we finally got it rebuilt, the disc liners lasted for two years and the glide plate lasted for two and a half. So if you're looking to sell parts, it's perhaps not your, not your best bet. And now I would open it up to anybody who has any questions, either by a chat or I guess we will just open up the, the phone line now. All the mutes are taken off, so feel free to ask questions. Um, please, please identify yourself when, if you ask. 
Uh, Bob, have you gotten any more installations on raw mills and, and cement plants over the past few no, years? Not, not really. Um, we probably got six or eight. Um, unfortunately, as you're aware, the cement industry hasn't spent any money in years. This is true, but everybody, of course, you know, you listen to the this current administration, and the uh, the building boom is about to take off again. Well, <laughs> I view that as a good. Maybe they'll spend some money now. Yeah, I'll just, I mean, that's uh, we still. I mean, the biggest problem we run into there has been, in my experience, has been trying to retrofit these uh, piezometrics uh, uh, in place of a triple gate in existing plants because yeah. of the headroom. Restrictions. That that is always a factor. That's that's why that's why we developed that that application form so that we can get a, get a feel for what kind of space we have to work with. Likewise, you know, I always ask customers, do you have a drawing, an elevation drawing, of that the, the area, so that I can take a good hard look at it and see what fits. I mean, did you ever come up with a minimum required headroom for surge being above these feeders in that type of application? I have some that don't have a lot, but oh, okay. No, there's no number that you can pull. Okay. Out. Anybody Hello, else? This, uh, yeah, this is John Arthur with Kansas City Power and Light, and I had a quick question for you. Sure. Um, my concern, or one of my concerns, is uh, I know you guys want to keep these posimetric feeders with uh, with some material in them, so that they've uh, they've got a constant, you know, I guess head or back pressure on that posimetric feeder, keep it full, uh, which is fine, except for when we're going into an extended outage. I want to make sure that that gets cleaned out, and it looks like there might be a low point in the bottom there. Uh, is there an easy way to get that completely cleaned out? Well, I guess it depends upon your definition of easy, John. Um, <laughs> yeah, when if and and I, you and I have spoken before, so I, I know the size feeders you're talking about. You're talking about large feeders, yes, um, with with multiple ducts. That the photograph I showed of that transfer feeder could very easily be the one that, and I don't remember specifics, but that could very easily be one that that you would use. Um, I would say that if you will, and the only way to get that last little bit of coal out of them is open up a door and pull it out. You know, drag it out with with a shovel or a broom or something of that, or suck it out with a with a back truck, that sort of thing. Because okay. when the when because the material has to fill or at least partially fill the, the machine so that it can lock against the duct the disc, mm -hmm. and once that drops to a below a minimum point. It, it just it just collapses. I would say that if you had that large machine there that you saw in that one picture, I'm going to say that if you could fill one drum with the coal that's left in it, I'd be surprised. Okay. So it's it's not a lot, but but you're absolutely right. There will be some left behind, and if if you're burning PRB and you are coming down for an extended outage. Yes, sir. Get it out of there. Flush it out yeah. below if you have to. Yeah, and and you know, just something we want to be aware of. I mean, yeah. you know, there's obviously combustible dust is a big issue for us and that's why we're looking at these, but we don't want to create another hazard while fixing fixing one problem to create another. But we just yeah. want to be aware of some of the uh those extended and, outage yeah. issues. Yeah, and that is what I would refer to as an operational solution. It, mm -hmm. it's not one it doesn't lend itself to a, a an engineered designed me mechanism. It just it's much simpler and more straightforward to just just know that yeah if you're going to come down if you, well you're probably not going to empty hoppers out if you're only coming down for hours. But if you're coming down more than a couple of more than a day say yeah you're going to want to empty that hopper out. And yeah and we have and, you know outages that last 30 days plus and we'd want to make sure. That you know, when we came down, that we just got everything cleaned out. It just had to be part of the outage procedure. I just wanted to make sure that I understood that up front. Yes, and you're you're absolutely right. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Okay. Well, I'd like to thank those of you who uh, attended.